And we're joined now by Commissioner Mohammed uh, Amir Mir from the South African Human Rights Commission. And uh, Sydney Isisgese is a certified financial planner at the Financial Planning Institute of South Africa. To both of you, thanks so much for joining us. Let's start with you, Commissioner. What does this all mean uh, with the uh, Concord's ruling? What it means is uh, good evening to and all of you and to your listeners. Salam alaikum and Eid Mubarak. Alaikum salam and thank you very much. It was a wonderful Eid. Um, what it actually means, it, it's, it's a tremendous victory for, for the underdog, and that's the judgment debtor um, who has now access to justice uh, when a Ganeshi order has been executed against this person. What the magistrate's court used to do in the past was they used to issue this Ganeshi order, and then the clerk of the court used to rubber stamp these things. So in other words, if the debtor and the creditor lived in, in, a, in a certain area, like for example, Stellenbosch, what the creditor would do is go to Krugersdorp and get an order against the, the judgment debtor. And, 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 and that was done by a clerk of the court. Now that was challenged in the Stellenbosch uh, case, which came before the Western Cape High Court. We as the South African Human Rights Commission, um, in terms of our constitutional mandate, were, uh, you know, were duty bound to, to enter as in, into the fray, into the matter, uh, on the basis that we came in as amicus curiae, the friend of the court, to tell the court that such practices are illegal, unlawful, and unconstitutional. So the long and the short is the Western Cape High Court then basically found in our favor, um, and as well as with the Stellenbosch Law Clinic. What that amounted to basically was that it said that there has to be a judicial oversight when such orders are uh, are granted. In other words, a magistrate, it's only a magistrate that can grant this order. But what now, happens to the existing orders? No, they were declared unlawful at that particular point in time. So they were unlawful, unconstitutional, and illegal. When this matter went to the Constitutional Court, okay, for, because it was a principle of the Constitution that was in violation, it is only the Constitutional Court that can certify uh, whether you know, it is unconstitutional or not. So therefore, this matter then went after the Western Cape Court had given the decision. Uh, in February 2016, uh, the Corn Court heard our arguments there as well um, uh, on behalf of the judgment debtors. And, and today was this landmark decision that came out in our favor. We are very excited about it because we think that there is protection. The Constitutional Court basically found a, a stri a struck a balance between the right of the creditor who, who, who loaned that money as an unsecured loan, as well as protecting the vulnerable judgment data as well. But saying that what must happen now is it's only a magistrate that can, that can, that can grant that order. All right, let's hear from the Financial uh, Planning Institute of South Africa, Sydney. Yes. For those that are heavily indebted, we know that the, out of the 18 million credit active South Africans, at least 75 have got impaired credit records. What does this mean for those that are heavily indebted? Yes, I think... Um you know, if, if you're in, in debt, you feel overwhelmed. You feel like uh, you can put your head in the sand and hope it will disappear. And unfortunately, uh, consumers need to, to, to face reality and, and charge their, their own debt and, and, and prioritize uh, debt so that they can have a sound financial uh, plan going forward. Yeah, but those that have this relief now uh, in terms of the constitution that uh, only a magistrate can issue a garnishy order and that the existing ones are in essentially unconstitutional. Um, Commissioner, what, what then happens in this case where mm. you still have the burden of having to service and finance your, your, your debt um, and, and, and now the, the courts have given you relief? What's the next step for the debtors and creditors alike? Okay, in relation to the existing debt, okay, that must take its course and it must finish off. The reason why the Constitutional Court would not have made this a retrospective judgment is it would have caused a lot of chaos in the, in, in the financial industry itself. For example, um, you know, it's in the judgment itself where you're talking about this, the financial market that's impacted by micro lenders runs into the trillions. Mm. Now, this judgment, uh, the, the, the amount of money that was given as unsecured loans translated into 168 billion rand. So that's a lot of money. Now, if the Constitutional Court had to make this as a retrospective judgment, it would mean it will cause chaos in the financial industry. So what it did was it said that its judgment is prospective. That means from today onwards, okay, 
any judgment, that's uh, any uh, emolument attachment order that's done without judicial oversight will be unlawful and illegal. But from today onwards going forward. Okay? Mm. But it will also then mean that any attorney or any uh, credit lender who's involved in this kind of practices must be taken to task and there'll be uh, punitive measures taken against yeah. them. But, but I think before it even gets to that, where you served with legal documents and all sorts of things and letters of demand, that there needs to be a conversation between the debtor and the creditor. Sydney, what is your advice as you were saying that it is something that often people see as humiliating, as uh, a sign of failure on your part for not being able to manage your finances? because of whatever circumstances. Yeah, for sure. I think this provides opportunities for consumers who are in debt to approach the service providers and, and negotiate a, a, a renewed plan of repayment. And, and it's, it's also a prudent way of, of taking uh, care of, of their financial, holistic financial plan because debt is part of a, a, a plan. There's good and bad debt. So, uh, you know, as, as consumers, it, it's an awareness um, um, platform to, yeah. to, for them to take charge of. Yeah, but, but there's also equal responsibility on the side of the creditor. So if you go and you apply for money that you know you, you ill at ease to, to afford, uh, in, it, you still have the rights, you're protected now by the Concord, but the, uh, the creditors are going to come after you and want their money. So, so what happens, what, what did the judgment say in, in that scenario where you're still getting the letters of demand and uh, uh, threats of, of either repossession or, or whatever else? I think from, from, from the judgment itself, I think the way forward is exactly what Sydney explained, is you go and talk about your, your, your problems to the person you loan money from, to, you know, to restructure your debt, okay? And obviously, now that a magistrate has to grant this order and not a clerk of the court, the, the magistrate will have to look at what you owe, what can you afford to repay, and structure a repayment plan accordingly like that and make that an order of court. So it will not just be granted en masse mm. as it was done in the past. So in that sense, the Constitution basically strikes a, a, a balance in the sense that the creditor's rights are secured, but the debtor's rights are also protected because now there is a court of law that will basically uh, you know, look into this kind of intervention to see that it's just and equitable. Remember, we're dealing with marginalized people. We're dealing with poor people. Okay, who are basically prone to the micro lending industry. So it's basically a question of Parliament also coming on board now to kind of close the gap, uh, which, which is now before Parliament anyway, you know, in terms of the amendments to the law, to say that they need to close those gaps to, allow, to avoid these kind of practices from taking place. Yeah, how do we get the message out there? Because if you're saying that these are marginalized communities and that they may still be susceptible to unscrupulous practices by uh, these uh, loan sharks or uh, money lenders, how do you educate your, your, your clients in yeah. that sense? The, the Financial Planning Institute, uh, every year, they um, have an outreach, which is called Financial Planning Week where they provide financial planning clinics to different companies for free. You may have a financial advice free of charge. And, and it's also an awareness campaign for the consumers to, to, to mm. have a, a, a proper uh, guidance in terms of the financial affairs. Yeah, so, and, and, yeah so, sorry, Sydney. Okay. And Commissioner, well, why should we celebrate uh, this particular aspect of our constitution? I think it shows very clearly and in no uncertain terms that the Constitutional Court will bend backwards for the marginalized and the poor. That in itself is a constitutional victory. Two, uh, in relation to what we need to be doing, I think from the Human Rights Commission we have nine provincial offices across the country in all nine provinces and we are going to do a wellness program and an outreach program and we're going to join hands with people like Sydney and, and his outfits to basically go out there and educate the masses. So should there be that kind of um, uh, challenges coming to the thing, we can also champion the, their cause. And also keep a check on the credit uh, providers as well, that they're not acting illegally anymore. Because should they be doing that, we, we can then uh, take them to task. Okay, we'll share your contact details on our website as well. Gentlemen, thanks indeed Thank for coming through and congratulations uh, for, for this uh, milestone victory. We're joined by Commissioner Mohamed Amirma from the South African Human Rights Commission and Sydney Sikese, a certified financial planner from Financial Planning Institute of South Africa.